just want to say thank you for this talk, and I, I haven't had a chance to read the book yet, but now I, I really do want to read the book, so that's right. uh, really interesting. And I guess um, I had a couple of questions. One, um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how you're defining traits. Um, and I understand that, you know, that you're signaling that there are shifting signifiers or perhaps, you know, there are different facets uh, that get used to signal race. So it could be culture, it could be religion, any kinds of things. But, like, behind the signifier, like, what, what is it? Like, what are those things um, indicating, basically? Um, so that's one question. And then the other question is, I, mean, I found it really interesting when you pointed out the kind of similarity of the, the doubling that applies uh, in anti-Semitism <coughs> and in Islamophobia. And I was wondering whether part of it has to do with religion being the signifier in those two cases and kind of anxieties about racial passing, that there's this kind of need to identify um, the, the visually or you know somehow visually identify the signifier that this person belongs to this group. And maybe those anxieties about passing, which I think are more relevant for perhaps religious, like religious uh, racialization, might help explain the kind of similarities. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, my, my kind of, um, you know, I take my understanding of race pretty much from Stuart Hall and his mm -hmm. work on, on um, how, on racial signification, right? And it's a work, particularly the work he was doing in, in the sort of early 90s on that. Um, uh, so, um, there is, yeah, so it's about reading, reading bodies, right, as, as, as presenting, um, signifiers of some inner essence that can be decoded through reading those signifiers mm -hmm. on the body, right? Um, and, uh, and I think that, I think we can, we can kind of extend what Paul was getting at there, um, to, to Islamophobe in the sense that um, you know you can add in clothing, you can add in um, other kinds of, of behaviour that you think you're seeing amongst the population, right? To, to, to play that role, um, and obviously um, the question then is is to is to be able to to spell out um, you know how that process of racialization has, has emerged, right? And what the mechanics of that would be. Um, Given, given that, as, as Stuart Hall would emphasize, you know, none of this is stable, it shifts over time, right? Um, and, and I think that, you know, part of that is, so, you know, some, some of that is going to be specific to a particular context, you know, the story in Britain, for example, is, 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 is very different, actually, from the, the story in the US on that question, because um, it's, it, it's so bound up with the whole history of, of Britain's um, experience with Muslim populations around the world through colonial, through Britain's colonial history. Uh, if you look at, you know, if you look at a newspaper report of how, um, you know, the, the, the British colonial regime, say in Sudan, was talking about Muslims um, in in the eighteen nineties, you know, the, the notions there are, are almost you can almost take these out words and, and read them in a British newspaper today. Um, Whereas in the U.S., it's much more product of, of um, the, the U.S. foreign policy uh, of, of sort of from the late seventies, early eighties onwards. Um, and then, in, ter in terms of this question of um, racial passing and, and, and the kind of question of religion, I mean, I think um, Yeah, there is. There, I think with with both anti-Semitism and Islamophobia, I think we're right that there is a there is a an anxiety around um, infiltration, right, and passing. Um, and and I think um, I mean I, I don't I don't think what's really um, behind that is 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 that both of them somehow are about uh, religion, right? I think what's I think really anti-Semitism anti is. Um, has become a model that, that Islamophobia has, has been able to draw on, and that's really what, what, why it has similarities. Um, and, and, and part of what's going on, you know, part of what's going on with the, the kind of anxiety of, of passing with anti-Semitism is, is bound up with all of those notions of, 
the wandering Jew, right, and, and partly the notion of diaspora and so forth, right, and so, um, you know, the, the it, and so the, the notion, the, the question of assimilation, right, was was, a, was that theme running right through the history of anti-Semitism, right, is, is, is assimilation possible, right, um, does assimilation happen when someone uh, becomes a French citizen, right, or um, is Jewishness this kind of hidden racial identity that, that means that assimilation is ultimately never going to happen, right? Um, it, it's it's cultural racism, not really, not actually racism. Of, of, uh, it really, it's not about religion; it's a cultural racism part of it. I think that's, that's driving that, right? And and um, I think Islamophobia just just kind of. Um, in some ways consciously, but also without without it being explicitly intended, kind of recycles that history. So I had a question uh, pertaining a little bit to something that you mentioned at the end. Uh, you started talking about the militarization of the border and uh, or the you know, U.S. Mexico border uh -huh. and um, war on drugs and things like that. Actual militarization. Mm -hmm. um, Put actually the you know the actual prospect that the NYPD might have long rifles and assault rifles mm -hmm. in a unit to protect and um, you know this widening net of surveillance um, you know which has been happening you know sort of concurrently or in context of this is sort of antithetical to that in the sense that um, you know they're never you know these police forces are never supposed to actually deploy. The te you know the technologies that they're getting right. They don't want ma you know they don't if they have mass protests yeah they have it but they don't you know the whole point of surveillance is supposed to nip that in the blood. And I was wondering if um you know maybe this is a much more you know this is a harder question but um do the funding structures and organizational structures um that go behind militarization actually building up SWAT teams coincide with this sort of social manipulation um. And then the reason I ask this was that is because post nine eleven is all about you know in the United States is all about the Department of Homeland Security fusing law enforcement with intelligence and the military, and extending that um, transnationally exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. So so, um, so so some of that story is is about. Um, you know, this huge, this huge, this huge amount of money that starts to flow um, after 9-11 uh, into all kinds of law enforcement agencies to do counter-terrorism, right? right. And, but without any terrorism to counter, actually, right? So, you know, you go to, I went to the Dallas Police Department, um, and um, they, you know, they, they had huge sums of money to um, buy all kinds of military equipment, in the name of, of homeland security, national security, counterterrorism, um, and and they had to basically make up stories to yeah. to kind of get that funding. So they made up a whole story about how Hezbollah were going to infiltrate across the Mexican border right. and target Dallas, um, which which had no kind of basis in reality. But um, yeah. as a result, they had a whole load of tanks and and kind of yeah. vehicles and, and weaponry and um, computer software. Um, and um, and so then they use that on, on the crimes that they do um, that they are aware of, right? Which is the biggest crime is in Dallas is, is stolen cars, right? So, mm -hmm. so 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 when the raid happens on a chop shop where where a stolen car is being um, broken up, um, it happens with an armored vehicle, right? Right. So um, that's you know that that's just that's just. So that's one part of the story, is it's, it's just kind of channels of funding and the kind of slightly perverse effects they have locally on police departments. Um, I mean, I think, I think on, the, on the thing about is, you know, you, the way you pose the question, interesting, I thought, it, it, as almost like the militarized response on the streets is, is, is an alternative to the surveillance, right? right. And, they, and, and they're, they're kind of, one is supposed to substitute for the other in some way. But, um, I think the more, for me, the way I would look at it is that you have this whole infrastructure that's been created um, that connects that connects um, the various tools of violence, mm -hmm. the various kind of technologies of violence with the 
tools and technologies of surveillance, right? Yeah. And it's kind of hard almost to draw a line between the two, yeah. right? I mean, most of the surveillance technologies have come back from from Iraq and Afghanistan, right? I mean, the software, the um, the techniques have, have you know, they're, they're kind of the you know the kind of empire coming home, yeah. and and um, so so and, and the, when you look at it globally like that, uh, which, which is actually I think the only way this stuff makes sense, then um, what you what you want to be I think your unit of analysis is is this whole global infrastructure, yeah. but you know that connects the the drone mm -hmm. to the um, NSA surveillance of the internet to mm -hmm. The FBI field office in Minnesota mm -hmm. that is um, running informants in the Somali community there, right? And, and I think it's a, it's, a, it's about this, this whole infrastructure hanging together. And, you know, and, and after all, the drone the drone that flies over Mogadishu is both um, you know it's both you being used for, for so-called targeted strikes and also sucking up all the Wi-Fi data. It's fine, right. right? It's the two go together, right? Mm. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't think that they're, you know, the, the, the kind of um, militarized technologies and the and the surveillance stuff are kind of opposites there. Mm. Um, and also, the, and then the, the final thing I say on that is, you know, surveillance. Surve you know, the lesson of the Stasi is that you can mm. have mass surveillance, but then sure. you, you, you know, you still get taken by surprise. Right? Mm. Right. So, um, you know, the, and, and because the the kind of analytic tools that inform how national security surveillance works are flawed, right? Yeah. It's, it's constantly misreading situations mm -hmm. and it's constantly um, seeing things that aren't there and missing things that are, that are, that are there, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, so and, and so then that leads to, um, you know, it, it does it, because of that. Then, then the militarized response will always be there, right? Um, because, because you don't have this type of knowledge that might allow you to preempt what you're trying to uh, Thank you for that very interesting uh, uh, talk. Um, what I actually wanted to ask about is uh, what you thought on the relationship between Islamophobia in the U.S. and the special relationship between uh, the U.S. and Israel. Um, I can think of two very clear examples of uh, pro-Israel narratives that serve this. Uh, from one hand, the evangelicals who always portray Palestine-Israel conflict as this, you know, um, religious war, which obviously serves their narrative. And also with APAC and this anti-Iranian, especially nowadays there's a lot of discussion about it in the media and the Israeli Prime Minister coming to the Congress talking yes or not. Uh, so I was wondering if, you know, within your sure. investigation, your work, you, you've touched on that issue, if that is actually one of the one of the core reasons or is it merely a symptom? Or right, so, right, right. I would be interested in hearing about sure, that. Sure, sure. So, um, you know, so you can tell a story about how um, in the late in the late seventies and the early eighties, um, there's um, pro-Israel political actors in DC who who start to um, systematically promote a, a message that associates Islam with terrorism, right? And and they're they're fairly transparent in um, you know in why they're doing that, which is as um, you know as in the U.S., you're beginning to get um, some kind of um, political critique of Israel's policies of, of occupation. Um, this this becomes an important part of how it, um, pro Israel lobby wants to respond by saying, look, don't read what's happening in the Middle East as a human rights issue or a military occupation issue. Read it as a um, an issue of religious fanaticism, right? And so you get. Um, uh, Particularly after the sub Massacre in 1982, you get that cons cons kind of concerted effort to do that, right? And and then subsequently, um, you know, right up to the present day, there's been that drive, right? Now, um, and then and then the other piece of this is is 
you know, the kind of overlaps and exchanges and interactions between, um, you know, law enforcement agencies here and, um, and, and kind of Israel as a, as a place to go to learn about how to do security in relation to Muslim populations, right? So you have, you know, you can see, you know, New York police department, other police departments constantly going to Israel as a reference place to, to sort of think about these questions of, of counter-terrorism, right? Now, having said that, um, you know, I think, I think that it's important just to sort of say that's one part of a the, of the much bigger picture, right? Um, and part of, you know, one of the, so, so you know, there, there's some money that has that been spent by elements within the pro-Israel lobby, right, to fund um, groups that have a, an obvious um, Islamophobic agenda, um, you know, and who, who do this kind of work, um, essentially propaganda work, right? Um, and, and you can actually trace that funding at a certain amount of, million of millions of dollars that's been spent on it, right? But that by itself just doesn't explain um, the kind of depth, I think, and the kind of systematic nature of this, of what we're looking at here, right? And, and I mean, if it did, then it would be possible for people who were opposed to Islamophobia to raise $20 million and, and do the counter-propaganda, but of course that, that wouldn't do it, right? And you know, the reason that, that Part of what's going on here is that is that the the Israeli narrative of um, of religious fanaticism and um, yeah of, of religious fanaticism kind of speaks to a um, much wider range of political forces in the U.S. Right beyond beyond just narrowly the pro-Israel lobby, it connects with humanitarian interventionists. It connects with um, all kinds of liberals, as well as conservatives, right? So the striking thing that I think it needs to be explained is is not how has this emerged from from you know conservatives or pro-Israel lobbyists, but how has it been able to become a, a near consensus across the whole political spectrum, right? Um, and that and that's um, that's because it connects with I think you know the deeper set of notions in in the history of race in America. <clears throat> uh, Arun, let me see if you can help me with a question that I've not yet formulated. <laughs> um, but it goes something like this. I think um, I, um, that you're moving the discussion uh, more towards the, the issue of uh, the links between empire, understanding this phenomena in relationship to empire, race, and coercion. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're displacing the argument, you're moving it, you're shifting it in a new direction. But I, I'm wondering, because recently I've been, uh, it was there before, but it's only uh, hit me very powerfully recently, that I think there's a new idiom out there, and uh, which is that it's the idiom, it's almost the idiom of, um, that the Muslim population in the U.S. and presumably also well in, in France uh, after the Charlie Hebdo incident is disaffected and disaffiliated mm -hmm. in these societies mm -hmm. and that there has been a failure in, in a sense of socialization, of incorporation, of assimilation, whatever term you want to use. And this, this idiom is not an idiom either of coercion, and it's certainly not necessarily or primarily uh, one that focuses on empire and race. It's one um, of concern of national integration, and especially among the second generation, I mean those mm -hmm. who were born there. And, and that got me to thinking a little bit if you compare then this new idiom of disaffiliation and, and disaffection uh, with, in contrast, say, with uh, the, the experience of the Mexicans in the U.S., who at one time were also represented a, a menace, and, and mm. for some still do, there we have, you know, the movement uh, of, say, the dreamers, you know, uh, and also the language which Obama himself in his presidential address said we were, we're going to, the, our migration, our immigration system is broken, we're going to regularize, we're going to normalize. It's more al almost like a, a, a language of 
human rights a la United States, mm -hmm. since it, there is yeah. no human uh, idiom of human rights here. And I'm wondering if there isn't something, uh, I mean, the, the two are slightly different. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I'm wondering if they're, by focusing so much on coercion and <coughs> what's going on at the level of the empire, if we're not also missing out something that is actually going on and quite central to this discussion. So, um, yeah, I think, I think because, because of the, um, because, because of the, the, the stuff that's happened in France in January, um, we've seen, we've seen the, what has been a, a, you know, something that's to do with very much with the French context of this debate about integration and kind of, um, you know, the, the kind of French notion of Republican values and so forth, right, that, that um, has now kind of, um, in a way, been, been kind of exposed to a much wider um, sphere here and, and, and other places, right? So, um, and, and certainly, you know, in fact, that's, it, it's, not, it's not only France, but in, in our, it, actually the Western Europe as a whole, that, that notion of integration has been... Um, central to, to these debates actually for, for a long time um, and so one of, one of the things that's happened there is that um, when people use this word in, integration has a long history in, in kind of if you like race relations policy in Europe right? which is different from the, the meaning of the word here um, but when when that word was used um, in race relations policy uh, up until um, by and large, nineteen eighties, it meant um, a broadly kind of liberal notion that you know that um, these new communities that have immigrated into Europe need to be given um, equal opportunities in terms of jobs, education, and housing, and then um, the cultural issues that have grown up by their presence will kind of evaporate. Um, and and um, and then in the in the nineties, um, the discourse shifted, right? So then in the nineties, that notion was abandoned, and instead, integration meant um, culture and values is the issue, right? Integration means um, there is a process by which these new communities that come into Europe need to. Um, internalize European values, um, which in each European country is slightly defined slightly differently, but you know, broadly in some notion of liberal values, and uh, and then that will then enable these populations to to participate in the labour market or succeed in education. Right, so it kind of reverses the the kind of causality that's implied in, in that analysis. Right, and so I think what what's part of what's been going on with um, the Charlie Hebdo stuff is is that is that discourse actually coming again, um, saying um, we need you know France needs to do a better job of, of working out how its um, Muslim population will will kind of go through this transformation in, in its value right out out of some notion of, of traditional culture to modern Europe. Right, um, and and then and then within that framework, then you have some voices who then say it doesn't help in that process if um, you know if we're chasing these kids around the bunya with you know with, with heavy-handed policing, and it doesn't help if they're facing discrimination in their type of job, um, and so um, you kind of then I think especially in the last month, we've seen a little bit of a return of that older notion that like, equal opportunity is, is, the, is the kind of... I mean, it hasn't gone back to that, but it's, it's a little bit come back of some notion of, of social and economic equality being important to kind of resolve the cultural... what's seen as primarily as cultural problems, right? Um, I, and, I, you know, I think there's a... There's a You know, I, I think I would want to be quite sceptical about about the notion of integration that's that's at work 
right? And, um, and the notion that um, that there's some kind of fixed, predefined set of French values or British values that um, incoming population somehow need to absorb, right? Yeah. No, I I don't want to um, in any way um, suggest that uh, integration or assimilation. Is, uh, is, is as a policy, as a solution. What, what I'm trying to underscore, I think, is, is the notion that it seems to me that the, the idiom and the language and the imaginary that's getting built around uh, some of these issues are not just based on uh, coercion and empire mm -hmm. and race, but that there's a, a parallel there. Uh, I mean, you've certainly given us a very compelling account of um, the, the part that underscores the coercion and the empire and the race. But I, I, I'm starting to hear um, another one. Uh, independently of whether one is in favor or against uh, you know, multiculturalism or republicanism mm. or integration mm. or assimilation, I mean, independently, okay. it's, it's just a different register, okay. which doesn't quite, um, I mean, one would have to figure out how the two, assuming that, uh, I, I mean, they're, they're, they're out there, both of them. And I'm wondering if they hang together or if they're on parallel tracks that they don't meet or if these represent uh, alternatives or, or what. But I, I do hear the other one as well. Okay. And, and the other one is... is, um, it, it's is almost, it has a tinge. Uh, again, in the U.S. you don't have human... There is no idiom of human rights. Uh, but you have a... Uh, when, when Obama gets up and says, well, these are families that have been with us, these are families that have paid their taxes, their children have grown up, they're your neighbors, and so on yeah. and so forth. Yeah. There, there's a... a it, I don't want to use the word, but there's a leniency. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's right. a... And this is coming from the top. Yeah. You know, this yeah, is yeah. not yeah. some, you know, corner cop in Brooklyn who's saying this. And... No, and yeah. I think I think you know. Um, so you know, the, transposing that to, to thinking about the uh, political rhetoric around Islam coming from the White House, you know, you, you can sort of point to something maybe parallel to that, which is this notion that um, you know, in fact, you had it you had it from Obama uh, just in the, in the last week or so, where um, there's this you know there's this kind of challenge that's coming from conservatives saying that Obama um, is refusing to say that we are at war with radicalism, right? He's refusing to use words like Islamism and, and so forth, and Islamic extremism. And the conservative notion there is that he's doing that because of unnecessary political correctness and so forth, right? And somewhere in there, there's an implication that maybe he's one of them and so forth, right? But, um, but you know, from from where Obama's coming from, you know, there's a uh, there's a kind of interesting notion of um, um, good Muslim, bad Muslim, yeah, right? So he, he will repeatedly say, um, you know, the majority of Muslims in the United States are peace-loving people, law-abiding people. They're Americans just like us. Right. Um, and there's a, almost like a whole kind of um, there's a whole load of actors, actually, not just the White House, who, who are kind of in various ways um, invoking those notions, right? Um, you know, Muslims are just ordinary Americans, right? right? So similar to, to what yeah. you described, right? So, so um, but, and, you know, and I think it's, it's, it's kind of complicated here, but I think part of, you know, part of what I find uh, about that is that, is that you know, there's, there's an implication of, of a good Muslim, bad Muslim, right? And then the question is, is how are you defining that, that bad Muslim? And, the, and when you look at this, the, the bad Muslim is being defined as, I think, actually, as the Muslim who somehow doesn't leave their culture behind, right? And somehow hasn't completed assimilation into our way of life, right? And, and um, so, so it's ambiguous to me. That whole, that whole kind of discourse, um, uh, and, and but is that it, would that fit? I mean, it, using your framework again, I, I, I'm trying to just yeah. go back to your argument. Using your framework of uh, 
securitization, coercion, empire, and race. Can this be accommodated? Yeah, no. yeah, no, I, mean, I think so. One of the things I, I, you know, one of the things I'm also doing in the book is is trying to look at these kind of cultural processes, right? And say, um, you know, along so there's a, there's a cultural project within the war on terror as well as a security project, right? In fact, the two kind of intermingle with each other, right? And the cultural project is is precisely to kind of um, use both hard power and soft power, to use the kind of jargon, right, of, um, to, to, to bring about cultural transformation within the Middle East and among Muslim populations in the US or Europe, right? So, and so when you then, and you know, and, and so the, even the FBI is, is kind of talks about it like this, right? So a purely security-based organization talks a lot about how do we get ordinary Muslims in the, in the kind of neighborhood where we're, we're involved to identify more closely with the U.S. culturally, right? Uh, and so how do you do that? Well, you, you find the, the good Muslim community and you empower them to articulate this message of, um, you know, re do not spend too much time connecting with the rest of the world and, and the experience of the Muslims in other parts of the world. Focus on your lives here in the U.S. You know, embrace the society, embrace its values. Right? Um, so that's part of the security um, world, as much as anything else, right? Mm -hmm. That whole, that whole exercise. Um, and, and you know, I mean, I, I, you know, I think you can see precedents for that in the way, um, you know, the way colonialism works, right? Where, where exactly the same kind of cultural notions were at play, um, and and fully wrapped up in in the kind of security world of colonial bureaucracy as well, right? So. Um, you know, Mahmoud Bandani has a has a really nice little book called Define and Rule, right? Which is all about this, which is all about um, how with with colonialism um, you define you define uh, um, the population and divide up the population according to these notions of tribe and race and religion and ethnicity that, that you bring, and then you categorize the tribes on in terms of you know are they good tribes or bad, tribes? And, and it's kind of it's kind of, you know, that's clearly part of what, what happened in Iraq um, since 2003, but also happens when, you know, when um, the Marines who are in Iraq come home and work for the FBI and do, and do the same thing for the American Muslims in, in uh, Houston, Texas. Um, so, yeah. You mentioned a couple of times the differences in the history of Islamophobia in the UK and the USA, and I was wondering um, if that led to any differences in Islamophobia today in the mm. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think um, you know, some of what that's to do with is, um, so in, in Britain, there's a, I think there's a lot more um, rhetoric that focuses on um, Like religious conservatism as as the problem, right? And so there's a lot more emphasis on questions of gender, right? Um, sexuality, sort of liberal values, right? And 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 partly that just reflects the fact that Britain is is um, you know it's not a, it, that a lot of those arguments would be harder to make in the U.S. because you wouldn't be able to say that Muslims represent the, um, you know the primary threat of religious conservatism in the United States, right? Because that would clearly be a Christian right. If you were someone who was a who was a secular liberal who who's, who wanted to say like where is the threat from religious conservatism to say women or, or gay people or right? it would be the Christian right. But in Britain you could more plausibly make the case I don't think it is possible, but you could more plausibly make the case that it's Muslim because we don't you know there's, there's no kind of significant organised Christian right in Britain. Or in fact, Western Europe, right? So, so then a whole load of, a whole load of, um, you know, kind of political movements that that come out of a particular kind of sector.
So, um, you know, which is not to say that, that you know, there are not huge and complex issues here around, um, you know, um, gender-based discrimination and the issue of sexuality in relation to minority communities in, in Holland or Britain. Um, but but that, I think that's, so that's one of the key differences, I think, is that notion of liberal values as, as a kind of slogan, right, which you see very much in France as well with the notion of freedom of expression, right. Um, uh, whereas, whereas I think in the US it's much more focused on terrorism, terrorism, terrorism. Right? That's, the key, that's the key thing. Um, and, and, you know, the, in, terms of, in terms of just the demographics, things look very different in Britain as well because, um, you know, so we don't have exact numbers in the US, but it looks roughly as if um, there's maybe two and a half, three million Muslims in the United States. Um, and it's the same number in, in Britain, you know, with a total population of, of you know, much less, like a third or less, right? So, um, so the, the, the proportion of Muslims in Britain is much higher. They have, they have come with a completely different history. So in Britain, by and large, they've, they've come through the colonial history in the Indian subcontinent. They've come into Britain, um, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, to do jobs at the bottom of the labour market, um, that, that the existing population was was moving away from doing. Um, whereas in the US, you know, the demographics of the Muslim population are um, probably about a third are African American, right? So then they're coming at this through a very particular kind of history of Black Muslims in the United States, which goes back, um, you know, all the way to the, the slave trade. Right, when, when a significant number of people who were brought over to the US as, as slaves were, were coming from Muslim Africa, right? Um, and then you have, um, you know, more recent immigration um, that is largely the product of a kind of Cold War brain drain, right? So students coming to the United States from Asia, Africa, the Middle East. Um, who happen to be Muslim, being recruited to do PhDs and so forth in a kind of brain drain rivalry with the Soviet Union, right? Who therefore, because they're coming with um, skills that are needed by the US economy, because of the way in which they're chosen through the immigration process, kind of then, you know, living quite comfortable lives in the suburbs in very different circumstances to people in Britain. Um, and, it, and it's really actually, for a lot of those people, it's only in 9-11 that, you know, the, the, the kind of, um, the American dream that they're living starts to look a little bit different, right? And suddenly they're, they're the suspects. Um, and then and then a whole different section of, of migration that probably kicks in more from the kind of 80s of, you know, refugees from various places and people coming in on, um, on, on less fancy kind of visas to do kind of, you know, taxi cabbing or, or more working class kind of jobs, right? Um, so that would be the picture of like the Somali community in, in Minnesota, which I, which I spent a lot of time working on. Um, so, um, so it's a it's a much more diverse population in the U.S. Uh, with every kind of part of the, the Muslim population around the world kind of represented roughly in proportion, actually. Right, unlike in Britain, where it's hugely disproportionately from India, Pakistan, Bangladesh. Right, um, and and here the, the kind of average kind of median income of Muslims in the US looks like the American average when Britain is way down. Um, I had a question about one of the things you mentioned in the very beginning of your talk. So you, you said that, I think you focused very much on that was um, very interesting and clear to me that the racism is part of this politics of the empire. But then before you also said that um, the Islamist terrorism was as part of this argument, therefore, more to be understood as an anti-imperialism more than as a, a perversion of religion. Um, and I'm interested in how far you developed that part okay. of your argument in the book, and in how far, um, I mean, I can see where you're coming from, but in how far do you think can you present this as an anti-imperialist struggle, comparable to very different other historical examples. So no, I don't think it's anti-imperialist. I, I, I think I said it's a perversion of anti-imperialism, right? Okay. And it's probably 
I know that might not be the help formulation here, but um, but um, what I'm getting at is is that um, I mean I think part of what what explains um, that the kinds of political violence we see coming from groups like Al Qaeda and, and ISIS is um, the um, the failure and and kind of um, uh, destruction of, of other kinds of acting periods, right? And so I think it's it's um, it's into that gap, into that space that then you see our fight emerge. Um, and you know that's that's um, that's a kind of long and complex history. And part of that history is is um, is really about the tail end of the Cold War, right? And and about how um, in in the you know, from from the kind of um, late seventies onwards, um, part of our, our foreign policy was to say, uh, you know, we will sponsor um, various kinds of political Islam as an alternative to communists and as an alternative to the left and as an alternative to that particular kind of anti imperialism, right? And so, um, you know, and that's that's also not just about foreign policy, but also domestically. So one of the one of the things that happened in Britain was that, um, you know, Britain in the in the um, early eighties, say the predominant um, the predominant kind of way in which young um, people who happen to be Muslim would would engage politically would be through some kind of secular left wing politics, right? And and that would be um, you know, they'd be taking on issues to do with maybe police racism, immigration, and so forth. And so, as a counter to that, what the what the government did was they said we want to find a more conservative voice to emerge from this community. So they they got mosque leaders together and said you need to form your own organisations so that you can be the counter to these young leftists. And and so. Um, and so it's then those those conservative mosque leaders who then, ten years later, are the ones who are burning copies of Salman Rushdie's satanic verses, right? And so then, with the end of the Cold War, you know, precisely the government's friends become the new enemies, right? Um, but but in the process, those those um, those kind of secular left wing alternatives have, have kind of been squashed and disappeared, um, and and so. That's playing out around the world. That's a story that you can tell in, in you know, in the streets of, of northern England as much as Karachi and and, um, and a whole lot of other things. So so um, you know, and then one of the things I try and do in the book is is talk about um, you know, I interviewed a number of people who've been on that journey of being young leftists, right, in the eight years, early nineties, um, but then. Out of out of the kind of I guess the moment of, of probably defeat for the left at the end of the Cold War, um, then Islam represents for them a new way of addressing the injustice that left wing politics had earlier addressed for them. Right? Islam becomes um, the substitute for that earlier form of anti imperialism. Right? Um, and um, and often. That conversion um, is happening by them reading the very books that um, that you know that we had produced in the U.S. Um, to, as as propaganda material for the Afghan majority in the 1980s. Right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the people I interviewed um, travelled to Pakistan um, as a Marxist and came back as an Islamist, having read one of these books, which basically it said to him. You know, the book is, is basically saying you can't be a Marxist if you're a Muslim, right? um, because that was that was the propaganda for the Afghan war against the Soviets in Afghanistan. Um, so, um, you know, that's I mean that's a, a large part of what's going on here. You know, so what is what is the um, and that's why you know the, the official version of it I think is wrong to to sort of see this in the history of religion. It's actually the history of. Mm -hmm. Of radical politics, right, and people looking for ways to to have a framework to make sense of the obvious injustice in the world and, and how how what might be a way of 
challenging, right? And and part and a lot of this is happening in the 90s when when everyone's talking about globalization, right? And so what Islam then offers is an alternative globalization. It's not a return to local specific settings. It's a it's a way of saying we are part of this global population that is all around the world and 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 represents a, a notion of justice. That, that can be an alternative to neoliberal global capitalism. Right? So I think that's that's kind of what I'm trying to get at with that. And and it, 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 you know probably worth adding that actually I don't think it represents an alternative to neoliberal global capitalism. And actually political Islam mm -hmm. ends up being being very useful to global capitalism. So um I agree with you that you cannot um, look at the war on terror without thinking about the US as an empire. But I think that that's maybe the way to look at it. If we look at, the, I mean, if seeing at the exterior um, section or um, environment of the war on terror, domestically, I think that it happens in a different way because we have to understand maybe the war on terror is one of the many emergency regimes that happen within the U.S. history. Mm -hmm. So, like, and every time that the monopoly of the use of violence is challenged or that the state thinks that it has been challenged, we have a regime, a regime of emergency. And I, I do think that. What you, the relation that you make between empire and race is also similar in, in theory to the US, but I don't think it's cultural racism, but it's an idea of the nation. Now, how the idea of the nation is constructed in each of the moments might be racialist, but it may, may be racist and racial, but it's not necessarily that exclusively that way. Like, for example, during the panel race in 1919, but the majority of deportations were about against Jews and Italians because they were the anarchists or the communists. During the Second World War, Japanese Americans and Japanese were uh, that uh, were relocated and detained um, for two years in the middle of Arizona, New Mexico. Um, and now, in the world of terror, we see a similar trend. However, I think it's more is the the target of the of this regime of emergency is more of, of a is it is Muslim because it's not Christian. Is that in, in the way that the how the the idea of the American nation is constructed as a Christian nation or at least as a secular nation where all religions can coexist as long as they are not radicalized or as long as they are not <coughs> radical. And also this related to so the way that you uh, you say that um, Muslims have been ra racialized by the FBI. Uh, by looking at this, uh, uh, about by being preemptive and looking at several kind of behaviors that already t already um, signal that this person is going to become a terrorist, that also has happened before. I mean, doing in Latin American, Western Europe, even in the U.S., the theory of subversion. If you're reading Gramsci or Mariachi, sure. uh, you were already a communist or an anarchist, and you already that signal you're already outside of the nation or outside of the idea that the elite or whoever was at the state at that moment saw as a nation. Um, so maybe that going back to the point that Elizabeth was uh, bringing up about cultural racism, maybe, but maybe also understanding how the um, America sees itself right now during the war on terror as a nation, and that obviously the boundaries of citizenship they have changed uh, mm -hmm. domestically at least. Right, right. I mean, I don't, I don't see, um, you know, I don't see that the, 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 there's a there's a kind of um, either or here, right? I mean. Mm -hmm. Race works yeah, through these notions of yeah. nation, right? And that's, I mean, you know, as I say, I take it, I take it, my thinking on this from Stuart Hall very much, right? Mm -hmm. Where, yeah. where of course, um, there isn't a there isn't a, a very absolute separation between nationalism and racism, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, um, and 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 your, you know, and, and I think your your examples kind of are consistent with that, right? So, the, you know, the Palmer raids. I, I would read the Palmer raids as, as also having this racial element too, mm -hmm. right? I, I mean, I don't think it's, it's um, you know, I think if you look at if you look at the way in which it, it, they were described at the time, the, the Jewishness of of many of the people being rounded up, or the Southern Europeanness of, of them, was part of the story there, right? And, mm -hmm. and you know, Alfred McCoy, who writes about that, talks about how the um, Kind of racial notions that had been a part of the, the internal, been part of the colonial racism in the Philippines, then come home after World War One, and and ethnicity is a is a lens through which, um, you know, through which racial notions that have been developed in the Philippines then become the then becomes an ethnic lens to look through, through um, back back for internal security, right? After World War One, right? Um, so 
um, and obviously with Japanese American, right? So, so um, you know, and I, I think um, in each of these cases, the notion of emergency is is at play, right? Um, uh, I don't. I just. Don't, I think we need. We need to. You know. I think the most people who, who work on on the war on terror uh, just do not um, want to see it as also a racial project, right? And I, I would insist that it is. And I, and I think that's essential to understanding what it is. Right? But that doesn't mean that that it's also not. It's, it doesn't mean that it's also. It's not also a a project of nationalism and a project of state mm -hmm. of emergency and so forth. Okay, well, thank you very much, and uh, we'll let you have your supper now. <laughs> your well done you. supper. <laughs> thank, thank you very much.